Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second last one of our Craft Conversations Winter Series. Uh, today, I'll be joined by three amazing artists uh, from the Bonavista Peninsula. One of them is moving there. It's actually from Halifax. Uh, I welcome everyone to enjoy this conversation. And before we start, I would like to read our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which the Craft Council Gallery is located as the ancestral homeland of, of the Beothuk and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothuk. We also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Inu of Nitsina and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the people of this province as we search for the collective healing and true reconciliation in honor of this beautiful land together. Uh, so as I said, tonight I'm here with uh, Claire McDonald, Barbara Houston, and Shane Walker, uh, who is going to be your MC for the night. Welcome, Jane. Uh, Jane Walker is an artist, writer, and arts administ administrator based on the Bona on Bonavista, Newfoundland. Originally from St. Philip's, Newfoundland, Jane earned a BFA in visual arts from Memorial University and a Master's of Research with distinction from the Glasgow School of Art for her research on rural art engagement in Scotland and Newfoundland. She has been involved with Union House Arts in Port Union since its inception in 2016 and has continued as a leader of the Artist Run Center ever since. Since June 2020, Jane has also been coordinator for the Craft at the Edge programming, a project of the Craft Council that was postponed and reconfigured due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's just a little bit about Jane. There is a lot more. And I'll pass the word to Jane that's going to talk to the artist today about how to grow a creative business in the rural community. I will ask to all the participants now that turn off your mics and your cameras so we can enjoy this beautiful presentation together. Jane. Thank you, Bruno, and thanks for having me um, as moderator for the session today. Um, I think um, judging by the interest uh, in registration, I'm, we're really happy to welcome everybody here today. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, I am going to introduce our speakers today, uh, Claire McDonald and Barbara Houston. Um, the format of today's session will be um, two pretty short presentations from Claire and Barbara speaking about their um, practices and the trajectories that have brought them uh, up to today, uh, followed by a discussion between the three of us. Um, and then there'll be some time at the end for a Q and A with the audience, okay? So with that said, I'm going to hop right in to introducing Barbara Houston. Barbara Houston's creative practice is based in Bonavista, Newfoundland. Born in Saskatchewan, Houston was influenced by modernist art on the prairies and landscape painting as an expression of place and belonging. From the prairies to Parsons School of Design, Design to Fine Art, holding degrees in environmental studies and architecture from the University of Manitoba, she paused her award-winning design firm based in Vancouver and studied fine arts at Emily Carr Institute of Art and Design. Returning to design and a myriad of other vocations, she gathered momentum collecting skills and observations to create space and discover opportunity. The catalyst to her creative practice at the moment was a cross-country <laughs> journey, which found her in Newfoundland, moving to Bonavista in 2019 to establish Barbara Houston Art Studio with an adjoining gallery and sheep shop, which highlights place-based art, craft, and design. Houston examines the intersections of art, craft, and design by paying tribute to the social fabric and skills that link its inhabitants to the landscape while providing meditations on the landscape itself. Through stories, material, and mediums, she captures the landscapes of people and place, community and belonging. Her work has a fluidity of scale that is both intimate and far-reaching, rural and global. So it's Barbara Houston. And next up, we have Claire McDonald, who is an artist and jewelry designer based in Halifax, Nova Scotia at the moment. 
Uh, she's a graduate of the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, where she completed a BFA with a major in jewelry design and metal smithing. Working primarily in metal, she uses her technical training to create both functional jewelry and small sculptural works. Over many years, Claire's interest in painting has led her to explore an interdisciplinary approach to her sculpture work that seeks to merge her painting and metal smithing practices. These works explore themes of memory and connection to place through fragmented painted imagery and a intended ambigu ambiguity between the familiar and the unfamiliar. Claire's jewelry designs similarly draw inspiration from memory and nature. Her work is categorized by a mix of organic forms and soft, graceful lines. Each piece serves as a tiny memento of coastal landscapes of Atlantic Canada landscapes that can be rugged and windswept, but beautiful. After graduating from NASCAD University in 2012, she spent a number of years living in Toronto, completing a three-year artist in residency at Harbour Front Center and gaining experience working for, for several artists and designers. She has exhibited and sold work throughout North America and has had her work included in several publications. Claire returned to Halifax in 2016 and has since been focusing primarily on building her jewelry business. Um, with that said, I'd like to welcome Barbara and Claire and thank them for participating today. Um, and we're gonna start off with some uh, short presentations from each of them, starting with Barbara. So I'm gonna just hand things right over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Jane. Um, I wanted to say right off the bat, thank you very much for coordinating all of this with Claire and I. You've been articulate and helpful and all those great things. And it's great to have the space to have this conversation. Um, like Jane said, I'll, I'll sort of circle back to a couple of things. I am what is considered an emerging artist. And um, my practice is uh, augmented by my interest in materials and those materials help me tell stories. Um, the sort of the circuitous route of me getting here is that I had been looking for a number of years to create exactly the space that I'm in right now. Absolutely, exactly. And I was in British Columbia and had a design firm and was struggling with that not necessarily being the place that I wanted to be. And so I sold most of everything, put it all in a little garage, bought the Westphalia and lived in it for six and a half months, driving across the country, looking specifically for the place that would allow me to do what I'm doing now. Um, so moving forward on that, I met a young artist, Larry Wayand, and she said, you might want to look to John Norman. He does some very interesting community-based development and work. And so at that time, Bruno and, I, Bruno and I were just talking about this, or we were talking as a group. I had won uh, an award for the kelp sheep. And the kelp sheep are a really great example of how I use material to start to tell stories or to encourage conversation around stories. Um, and they were, they were built, I built them entirely as a conversation piece because I was new to Newfoundland. So uh, after winning that award, which I was very proud of, and having an exhibit at the Craft Council with a number of other artists, I reached out to John Norman, had no idea who he was, Google John Norman, find out that he's got all these great things, and I sent a note off to him. We had a couple of conversations, as, as many would likely know, is that John's a busy man. And two years ago, March, literally this month, I drove from the little town I was staying in here to Bonavista, and John offered me this incredible commercial lease, which is where I am now. So the Moland House is a 1948, what John would call a modern salt box. And just to give you sort of a the lay of the land, it's um, they had just done a renovation to it, so it was it was brand new in terms of the finishing and materials inside. The front room, which would have been considered the living space or the sitting room, is essentially a gallery space. The next room, which was the kitchen, is where the sheep shop is. And I'll talk about that and where that idea came from. And then connecting all of those is 
my art studio and it's where I make absolutely everything and I'm, I'm flipping my arms around because it's just behind me from where I'm sitting right now. Um, and then the brilliant thing about this particular opportunity that John put uh, offered me is that I live upstairs. And so it is truly a live work commercial space that I can, I come down every day with my coffee and work away and, and whether it's an open season or it's not, I'm here. And um, it's, it's quite, quite remarkable. So I arrived in 2019 in May and I opened in June. And I like to say that for the, the run of the season, I was running after the bus the whole time because I didn't have anything really other than a bunch of big kelp sheep and a few other things that I had started to make. Um, and as thrilling as it was when somebody said, I'd like to buy this, I had to run back into the back and make another one or make another 10 or whichever. Um, but all that being said, it, it was and has been sort of a remarkable change in terms of change and choice for me in terms of um, an artist and doing what I'm doing each day. Um, within the spaces themselves, I have a number of artists that I met as I, as I arrived in Newfoundland, one of which is Jane Witten, and she does these beautiful, very uh, place-based, uh, whether it's woven seaweed baskets or she upcycles material. She also knits these incredible little eyelets and they are encrusted with sand from a beach just down by Jane's house and another you know, beach over by Keels and Dunterra. It's, they're remarkable things. Um, same with another, uh, another person whose place I actually rented for a while when I first arrived here. Catherine uh, makes beautiful organic cotton sheep shop pajamas. She does um, modern crochet. Uh, she does uh, pojaggy, which is a rust dyed curtains and detail. So, there are a number of artists that are here and this year I'm very excited to have Claire's work here. And that sort of segues into another, another part of all of this. I think the interesting thing about um, the Moland House in particular and Bonavista is that um, as much as I arrived in Newfoundland and didn't know anyone, I don't feel like I'm on my own because there's an incredibly strong community. And that for me as a person, uh, takes me back to uh, where I grew up and how I grew up. And that was in the middle of the prairies, very similar to an isolated or rural setting. Um, people kind of giggle when I say, I feel so much at home when I look out at the sea, I personally see great big wheat fields and flat vistas because that's what I grew up with. I also grew up with a community that cared about who you are and what you're doing. And that that um, that's very much here in Bonavista. So the Moland House has given me this great opportunity in a space that is, I think, um, relatable because it's a house. It looks less intimidating as, you know, it's not a, a little white cube like a lot of gallery spaces can be. So it's quite an approachable thing. There are a bunch of kelp sheep sitting out on the front lawn, right? Not right now, but they are, they are out there in the summertime. And all of that really, um, adds to sort of the interest here in terms of Bonavista. I think the other thing that for me is important as an artist is that the uh, sense of belonging and belonging within a much bigger group of people. So um, yeah, we're talking to, to Joan, to Bruno, to other people that live, whether live and work in St. John's, um, specifically here on the Bonavista Peninsula, there's a very, very strong sense of connection and community. Um, and I, I will talk about sort of the relationship of all of that and how it's affected my practice um, as we sort of carry on. So my focus tends to be, um, it will shift. It will shift according to sort of what is required of me in order to run a business and, and keep afloat and carry on to the next year. Um, my my day looks quite different in the summer than it does in the winter time. So from, you know, the end of November, early December through till March, April, my head's down and I'm working on new things for the new, the new season, the upcoming season. So the um, current 
practice uh, that I have um, will and does encompass everything from drawing and painting to sculpture. I, I really don't limit myself or don't try to limit myself uh, in terms of the kinds of things that I work with. Um, the materials that I tend to work with are anywhere between linen, canvas for painting in particular, um, painting in oil as well as acrylic. I paint on panels that are uh, torrified maple, um, paper. I have no, been known to paint on steel roofing tiles um, and use recycled materials to weave. You would have seen in the introduction um, page that Jane put together, a great big moose head and all of that is reclaimed material that I weave and make, et cetera. And all of the intention around what I do is through observation and wanting to learn more about where I am and honoring the traditions and the cultures and the people that are here that I'm a part of. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of the practice. Uh, summertime is busy uh, and wintertime is equally, equally so. Um, the exciting news coming up is that I'm moving and Claire's moving in. And that is, um, that's exciting on a number of levels. Um, firstly, that I'll be moving into a new space that is, again, a live work environment, like what Claire will be taking on here. Um, it will have a, a larger studio, a gallery space, and a place where I will live. Um, and also, I think the other thing that is, is significant and, and uh, remarkable for me as an emerging artist is that in January, I was offered a solo show, my first solo show at uh, Fisher's Loft. And I've got, I think today I counted 42 paintings complete, um, uh, which and now some of them aren't very big, some of them are quite small, uh, but that in itself is again, for me, another indication, another marker of of the sort of the broad reach of community and this particular community in and around the Bonavista Peninsula. And that's 10 minutes and I've got my, I'll stop now. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I think You're that's welcome. a really great transition um, over to Claire. So uh, your news has been spoiled, Claire. Um, I'll hand <laughs> things over to you now. <laughs> Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Bruno, and, and Barbara. I really enjoyed hearing about um, everything, and I'm excited for you for what's next. It's really exciting. Um, I have a, a few images that I'm going to share, and I'm just going to bring that up because um, I thought I would just do a little um, recap of sort of the evolution of my practice over um, the years, just to give context to, um, I guess, me moving to Bonavista and taking this big leap. Um, so I guess as Jane and, and Barbara and Bruno mentioned, um, my name is Claire and I'm a jewelry designer and artist. I'm based in Mi'kmaqi, the unceded and, and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaqi people. Um, I studied at NASCAD University. I graduated in 2012. Um, and when I started at NASCAD, um, my intention was actually to study painting. Um, I really loved painting at the time and I just ended up uh, picking up a jewelry course, mostly out of curiosity. Um, and I remember the first time I, I entered the jewelry studio, I was just in total awe. All of the tools, the equipment, everything was completely new to me and I was so intrigued. Um, so I just sort of dove in and had a bit of a love-hate relationship with it at first, but I just, I felt like there was so much to learn and I was so curious. So that's what I ended up pursuing. Um, but over the years, um, I've sort of developed a practice that dabbles between both paint and metal, um, between sculptural work and also functional jewelry work. Um, but both facets of my practice are both really heavily influenced by landscape um, and memory. Um, when I graduated from NASCAD in 2012, um, I actually moved 
um, immediately to Toronto. Um, I began an artist in residency there um, at Harborfront Center and the residency was three years long um, and it was a really unique opportunity in that um, I was working in the metal studio but it was also connected to three other studios, a ceramics studio, um, a glass studio and a textile studio. So every time I went into studio, I was surrounded by a bunch of other artists working in different mediums. And we were all at various stages of our careers. So it was a really inspiring place to work. Um, and I really learned a lot from uh, sort of building community, both within the studio, but also sort of within the greater arts community in Toronto and then within Ontario. And also sort of beginning to understand our place in community um, within the Canadian art scene. Um, so that was a really wonderful experience. Um, while I was in um, Toronto, I was focusing a lot on what I had begun in my final year at NASCAD, which was trying to merge my painting and metalsmithing practices, which um, was sort of a bit of a big undertaking, but something that I still even to this day haven't been able to let go of. Um, so on the right was a, a painting that I did on wood. Um, and then I cut out pieces from that painting and incorporated it into a, a necklace on the left. Um, this Claire, is just sorry to interrupt, but That's your okay. screen is not moving for me. I don't know if it's anyone else's. Oh, shoot. Is it moving for anyone else? No. Oh, oh, you know what? It says sharing is paused. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. That's okay. I'm enjoying listening <laughs> to you. Share. Yeah, that's okay. You would just keep talking. <laughs> okay, let me see. My window is to the front. Sorry, guys. Um, let me just start this over here. Oh, this will make more sense, I think. <laughs> there. Okay, so let me back Lovely. up here. Oh, oh, how do I go back? Oh, oh no, <laughs> sorry. Perfect. Okay. Um, I wonder if it was because I was on full screen mode. Does that mess things up? I wonder. Give it a try. Okay. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah, it's pausing. Maybe I'll just, sorry, technical challenge. Maybe I'll just, um, I'll just share it from here. Is that okay? Yeah, just scroll through. That's fine. okay. Yeah, I'll just scroll through. Okay. Um, so that was the first, sorry, that was the first example. That probably makes more sense now. Um, and then that was just another piece there. Um, and uh, so at the time, I was deconstructing a lot of my paintings on wood. Um, and because I had trained as a metalsmith, um, I felt I was starting to feel really limited because I wanted to bring dimension to more dimension to the pieces. Um, so I became really curious about the possibility of actually applying paint directly to metal. Um, and there was a lot of technical challenges that came along with that. Um, but while I was at Harborfront, I learned a lot from my peers and my mentors, the importance of uh, looking into funding um, to undertake different research projects. Um, so while I was in Toronto, I was fortunate to receive a couple grants that allowed me to pursue um, some research. Uh, one of them, which allowed me to travel to Italy where I took a workshop that was um, specifically about the application of paint on metal. And that really gave me the confidence to sort of move, continue moving in that direction with my work. Um, so that was an example from 2015, paint on metal and another uh, paint on metal. And then in 2016, um, I had the opportunity to return home to Halifax. And I kind of look back on this time and think that it was almost like, <laughs> I felt like living in Toronto was kind of like, living on one of those moving sidewalks in an airport and then moving back to Halifax was kind of like jumping off the moving sidewalk and coming to this sudden halt um, because life in Toronto was, was wonderful, lots of great experiences, but it was definitely very, very busy. I was working like seven days a week between the studio and jobs and coming back to Halifax was just kind of a bit of a, 
like a sigh of relief um, to just have a bit more quiet. Um, and coming back was interesting um, because I had left a recent grad and I was returning um, sort of without that nice cushion of, of student life and my student community. Um, so I was sort of starting fresh in a way of trying to figure out um, sort of where, where I fit within the community and where I wanted to take my career. Um, and at that time, I made the decision to sort of put my sculpture work on hold a little bit while I um, tried to build a bit of a business um, from my jewelry design. So when I moved back, I was spending a huge amount of time outside. I realized how much I had missed living by the ocean. I was going to the beach a lot. And um, from my apartment, I could see a little slice of the harbor. And I would walk my dog down on the waterfront most days. Um, so I was always, always, always by the water and sort of observing how the light would reflect off of the water in different conditions. And soon enough, I would return to my studio and um, the influence of just constantly being around water started to really come through. And I launched my first jewelry collection, um, which was called the Wave Collection, um, directly inspired by the ocean. And it was a line of sterling silver jewelry. And many of these pieces are sort of like bread and butter pieces of, of my business. They're still quite popular um, from the first collection. And then I'm just going to sidetrack really quick here for a sec, um, sort of to talk about Newfoundland a little bit. Um, my mom's side of the family is actually from Newfoundland. So when I was growing up, we would come to Newfoundland probably about once a year. I had grandparents in St. John's and my great grandparents were on the West Coast in port port So we would usually go between the two places once a year or so. Um, when I was about 14 or 15, I think everyone at that point had moved to Nova Scotia. So that had been like the last time that I was, I was there. And then in more recent years, I had the opportunity to visit Newfoundland a number of times. And it was the first time I went back as an adult. And it was, it was so amazing to, to visit this place that I had so many childhood memories of. Um, and I felt sort of this strange connection, but it was also based on a lot of of memories that I had from when I was a kid. Um, and this picture is from a hike I did in Babels in May, 2018. It was really cold on that visit. I'm pretty sure it snowed, um, but on that hike, I collected a few flowers. Um, and I, I did that sort of as I was sort of thinking about how I would remember um, my time on this visit and this particular hike. So I collected these flowers and I pressed them. When I returned to Halifax, I ended up sort of diving back into my sculpture work a little bit. I made this painting on a sheet of copper. And then I started to work backwards by deconstructing it into floral forms and then reconstructing it into the flowers that sort of inspired it from the beginning. In 2019, um, on a visit to Newfoundland, um, it fortunately coincided with um, my friend Elliot's visit also to Newfoundland and Elliot's family has a cabin in a place called Port Kerwin and I had heard so much about Port Kerwin over the years um, and what an important place that was to his family so it was really amazing to finally go visit um, and we sort of hiked along the shoreline there um, we were picking blueberries it was a really nice time um, but I it it sort of had like this profound effect on me where I just remember standing in this spot and looking out and just thinking like, wow, so many, like it was such a significant place to his family. Um, and I was sort of there as a tourist um, and to sort of ground myself in the moment, I started looking at some of the details of the place and looking at the plants that were around me and those are pictured there on the right. And then when I went back to Halifax, um, I ended up creating this piece looking out then and now and it was sort of a piece thinking about honoring this place that was really special to my friend's family, um, but also acknowledging sort of my viewpoint as a tourist and visiting that place. Um, over the past few years, I've really started to think about ways that we remember place. Um, and this has become relevant to both my sculpture work and my jewelry. Um, as a child, I would always collect rocks from beaches I would visit. Um, and I remember like visiting my grand great grandparents in Port-a-Port -Port, um, collecting fool's gold from the beach across from their house um, and always having those pieces as like little markers of memory from visits there. 
And so on recent visits to Newfoundland, um, I was really thinking about collecting rocks and how rocks can sort of, they they're sort of like a common thing that people collect to remember places. Um, and this is a really cool picture. Um, my mom took it when she went back to visit my great grandparents place in 2013. At the time, um, the house is abandoned, no one's living there, um, but there's still rocks in the windowsill. Um, this was from my re most recent visit to Newfoundland this past fall. Um, I was looking at uh, wishing stones, which are rocks with the continuous line through them and thinking about um, sort of how we reflect on, on objects that make us think of places, how we reflect on those maybe after the fact. And I, I've always sort of arranged them. And then I did a little painting on the right. And then most recently um, I launched the Wishing Stone Collection, which is a line of sterling silver jewelry that's inspired by <clears throat> wishing stones and how um, these places can sort of maybe help us recall memories of being along the coast. Uh, this was sort of like a new direction where I was uh, just reducing the forms to the most essential lines. And then I'm just gonna end here with two slides. Um, this was um, a photo of me at my first show in Halifax in 2016 with my jewelry line and then this was my most recent show which sadly was in 2019 because no shows happened in 2020 because of the pandemic um but i just i don't think i could have gone from here to there in those three years um sort of without the richness of the community here in halifax and just sort of really um really leaning into the, the support of my peers and the people within the crafts community and within the community in general. And I think just reflecting on um, the years since I've graduated at NASCAD, you know, living in Toronto and in Halifax and then looking forward towards Bonavista. Um, I, don't, I don't really think that the size of the place you're living or the size of your community really matters that much, but more so sort of your open, openness and willingness to engage with the people that are in your community. And I've definitely really experienced that here in Halifax. And on my few visits to Bonavista, it's been really apparent to me that, um, yeah, the sense of community is really wonderful. So I'm very much looking forward to taking the leap. So I hope to see some of you in Bonavista next year. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. I actually um, put my little wishing stone by my computer tonight, just as a little oh, good I luck it. charm. It's a pretty oh, good one. Oh, that um, is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, for the next piece of the evening, um, I'm just gonna lead a conversation between Barbara and Claire. Um, and then there'll be a few minutes at the end uh, for questions from the audience. So, um, my first question uh, is something I don't think that we can ignore. Um, so the pandemic has been such a curveball for business owners all over the globe. How do you think, um, how has your business and creative practice responded over the past year? And how are you preparing for the 2021 season? Uh, and I'll start, I'll start with Claire and I'm going to just like add some detail to that question. So you're making a huge leap in deciding to move your business to Bonavista. Did the pandemic play a part in that decision at all? And does the expanding reach of e-commerce e and digital marketing make that transition um, easier and maybe like lessen the risk? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think yes. Um, as, as you saw from my final slide, my last in-person show was in 2019, which is so hard to believe now. Um, but the way that my business was sort of modeled up until the pandemic began last year was that I a huge percentage of my income came from doing in-person shows. Um, so through the Crafts Council and a number of other shows, um, you know, I'd probably do four or five shows at Christmas, some in the summer one or two in the spring. Um, and that was where the bulk of my income was coming from. And then in, when the pandemic hit, all of that was gone. Um, there was no option to sell at these, these craft shows anymore. Um, so I really had to rethink how 
I was going to get my products to my customers. Um, so that's when I, I really sort of took stock of, of my website and I did have an online shop, but it didn't, it wasn't bringing in a huge amount of traffic. Um, so I actually ended up taking um, an e-commerce course, thankfully pretty early on in the pandemic uh, back in May. And I took some time away from the studio in the, su in the summertime um, to just kind of revamp my website and get it sort of set up to be able to do e-commerce. Um, and then by Christmas, this past Christmas, um, I did like a full Christmas season online. Um, and I think that really sort of gaining confidence in, in operating my business in a more online world, I guess, has really given me the confidence to be able to be taking this leap to move to a rural, rural area. Um, because, you know, I, I know living somewhere like Bonavista, yes, having a shop that's open to the public is great, but it can't be the only way that I'm reaching my customers um, because there is sort of like a seasonal market for that. Um, so I feel like it just sort of like rethinking the, the way that I'm operating my business sort of, it definitely gave me the confidence to be like, okay, I'm ready to take the leap. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to shift the question a little bit for Barbara, because you are in a different situation mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic. So Barbara, I'm sure you spent October to March of last year preparing for a hustling and bustling 2020 season. Tell us about your expectations versus reality and I guess, talk us through what worked, what didn't, and what's your approach for 2021? Um, ex expectations versus reality is, <laughs> is uh, that's a good one, really. For um, I think I know what happened in March of last year is that we literally had to, everything shut down. And I remember clearly putting everything in tubs and trugs, taking all my paintings off the wall, covering everything up and sitting in the corner and sobbing. And, and it, you know, that was the reality of the situation. And, that, and after a little bit of time, I recognized that I just needed to figure the next step, ne next steps. Um, and thankfully, people within the community started to reach out. And so I didn't feel, because I'd only been here a year, I didn't really feel very, you know, I, I'm, I feel more connected now, but again, I didn't know a lot of people. And so I was really fortunate. There were people like CBDC who, you know, small business loans. I had, I had a, also been given a little grant to do uh, QuickBooks accounting, really a great thing given that I'm very nonlinear and they want me to think in a straight line, but very helpful. So I started to um, look for solutions I have, as you know, a great landlord who provided commercial rent relief. Um, and I started to move my the sheep shop component of things as a separate entity from barbiehouston.ca, the, the paintings and sculpture. And so it gave me actually time to do things, but I had literally had made everything I thought I needed for 2020 um, and 2020 happened still. And I think the, the important takeaway that I learned and in hindsight is that it was really important then and it is now that I opened up the doors. So as soon as I was able to, allowed to, with plexiglass screens and dots on the floor and masks at the front door, middle of June, I opened up the doors because this is, unlike Claire, who has a very strong um, online presence, I don't. And majority of mine, 95% of what it is that uh, is my income is from people coming in the door. So I didn't really have an al al alternative other than I've started to pivot that. So expectations and reality were, were quite remarkable. That being said, to be you know, quite honest and, and, and straightforward is that I was expecting to lose 50 to 75% of my income. And it was not even close to that. It was 15%. And that was, but that was a lot of hustle. That was hustling hard and changing products and, and being open every day, even people, even if people weren't in the door, it was, it was sending a really strong message that I'm still here, I'm not giving up, 
and this this is my life this is what i have to do to to adapt so it for me it was it has been a tremendous learning curve and it it talks about being really resourceful as a business person as a creative business person and uh, and yeah yeah i think both of your answers while different both kind of key takeaway is to just keep moving forward because if totally. you stop that's when everything's yeah, gonna fall apart you know um i have so many questions but i do still want to leave um time for questions from the audience so i'm gonna ask one more and then we're gonna open it up um so okay if your creative business was a table or a chair um what are the legs holding it up and how do they support each other start with barbara this time um i think that uh i think that the analogy of the kitchen table in newfoundland and that you sit around and chat and you're part of a community that that's that's a really important thing so more of a table than a chair um and then and then the obvious legs are that here in Bonavista, there's a there's a big community on the peninsula in particular. There are Newfoundlanders that support Newfoundlanders, and and I saw that um, with both the stories and the interest of people coming in. That would be another leg. There's also the you know the the granting and and larger bodies like Arts NL who are interested in in supporting artists. And then another one that again is quite local and something that I drew on a lot is that I did all kinds of webinars. It's where I found my, my wonderful social media guru, Rachel. Um, I took on a number, I did a number of Zoom calls and webinars on social media, trying to sort of learn more of how I could start to pivot things. So that was through the Chamber of Commerce. I'm, I'm sure that there are other ones that are available, but those are things that, within the community here that became very strong and I think that the community itself and not feeling like you're on your own really makes a big difference the honks as you're going down to the post office and and the the checking in of uh, of how you're doing so it's the sitting around the table and and uh and showing up for that I think is really important thank you so much Claire any thoughts yeah I would say definitely um the yeah the community for sure um and that would go for you know my peers like my fellow jewelry designers um i have some studio mates um and just within the jewelry community in halifax um it's just been so nice to sort of i'm really thankful for for the jewelry community here and that everyone is is very open and supportive of each other and we're always sharing knowledge back and forth and troubleshooting um, things with each other. And I, I'm really thankful for that. That's been a huge support. Um, and then also just the craft community in general here um, for all the, you know, different creative shows and stuff that have been made available through the craft community here. And then the people who show up to those shows and show support. Um, yeah. There's been so much support here, at least in Halifax, um, for buying local. Um, that was sort of like a really huge thing this Christmas. Um, and then the friends and family who were just kind of there to, you know, when, as we were, Barbara, you mentioned sort of like getting to that point where you're just like, oh, it's just like, how do we move forward and things get really tough and, and just, yeah, having those people that are just kind of rooting you on in the background. Um, and then just also like, I'm, I'm, I think like just the natural landscape of, of living in Atlantic Canada is something that um, really provides a lot of um, sort of inspiration and drive to my practice. Um, I'm in the studio a lot, but I also spend a huge amount of time outdoors. I'm up early most mornings out for a run and, and I feel like that really brings a lot of energy um, that carries into my practice, so yeah. Thank you so much, both of you, um, for your generous sharing of your practices today. I'm going to open it up now to questions um, from everyone else on the call. So if you would like to turn on your camera um, and your mic, if you're interested in asking a question, please feel free to do so now. Um, or if you'd like to type into the little chat box and ask a question that way, um, that'd be great. If not, I do have one other question. Uh, 
It can also be comments. It can also be feedback. <laughs> it can also be just a little bit more interactive, whatever you feel like um, you need to, uh, you know. Jane, there was one other thing I wanted to add about yeah. this last, you know, um, Claire talked about uh, not having the opportunity to have craft fairs, etc., because of COVID. We were really lucky here that there was a tremendous little, uh, at the Matthew Legacy, there was a community driven um, maker's market here. There's a maker's map here as well. And then into St. John's it was wonderful through Kitty Bitty. We had a Bonavista Peninsula edition, um, which was a wonderful uh, collaboration between all of the very talented artisans and artists in the in Kitty Bitty and Bonavista Peninsula makers and artisans and artists. And that that was a great way to sort of be reminded of uh, the connections uh, of people and, and place here and how far reaching it really is. Yeah, I think everybody wanted to lift oh, yeah. up <laughs> everybody else and like yeah. make new supports that are safe and that work for everybody. So it was really inspiring to see all these organizations pivot, including the Craft Council, of course, um, who Bruno was saying before we started how he's not an online person and learned as more than he ever knew about computers this year. <laughs> I think we all did. Um, Emily, do you have a comment or question that you'd like to I share? Have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so both of, well, first of all, thanks guys. This was really great and super inspiring. I'm, um, I have loved uh, following along so far. Um, you. You're welcome. I'm wondering if you guys feel like both of you have had um, time in larger cities. If you feel like that was important, an important piece of establishing your practice in a smaller place. Um, for question. me, I would, uh, I, having, I lived both in New York and Vancouver and, and had, have consciously made a choice to be here because it helps me to focus on the practice. Um, without question, I think in my, both my practice and in my business, it's all like for all of us is that accumulation of experience. Um, and you you sort of take that forward to where you are now. Um, I think that there, you know, the rigors of working, uh, having a business in a in a bigger center, really keeps you on your toes. Um, right. But there's, you know, every, it's different for everybody in every place in, in terms of how you how you operate your business and sort of the integrity and things behind that. But we, I think we all take it with us. I, for me, what I've really learned is that there is a much more, much more accessible component here in rural Newfoundland than there is in any big city that I've ever lived in, in the course of my life. This, this kind of an opportunity that I've been afforded by John Norman and, and this lease and now building a new studio and having a solo show, I don't think it could have happened for me in any other place in Canada. I just don't think it would. I think that there's this wonderful, wonderful groundswell of people and skill and craft and ability that is, is barely untapped in Newfoundland. So how optimistic is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great answer. Thanks. Um, hi, Emily. That's such a great question. Um, I've sort of like thought about that sometimes a little bit before, like what if I hadn't spent some time in Toronto? Um, and I, I, I really think it was important for me to leave Halifax and to have that experience in a bigger city. Um, I was there for four and a half years. And I think it just, it really put things in perspective for me, like just living in this big place. And I don't know, I think just the, just sort of, it just sort of expanded my view of like where I fit sort of in the scheme of things. Um, and also just the types of work experience that I gained um, working for people who had small businesses in the context of a bigger city um, was just really, it was really eye opening, um, just learning more about the industry. Um, and I don't know, like I worked for a painter um, in Toronto as a studio assistant. And I also worked for a goldsmith um, 
and in both cases, like I really learned a lot about, you know, there's a lot of competition living in a big city. And so there's, I don't know, just ways of, of running a business in a big city um, really taught me a lot. And then sort of moving into like a smaller, more rural context, you can sort of draw upon those skills and apply them in, in different ways, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so we, first of all, thank you so much. That was a beautiful presentation and it was wonderful to understand your life journey to get to where you are. Um, I have a comment here. One of the participants says, uh, such inspiring people uh, with such amazing journeys. Um, thank you for the talk. And I also have a question. Um, how can we get more people like you to move here? I'm assuming someone that lives in the Bona Vista Peninsula. <laughs> Um, Claire, can I can I start can you, actually? Yeah, yeah. yeah. go for it, <laughs> Um, I think that there's a lot of myth busting that needs to be done about what it can be to build a creative practice here. Um, I think having these conversations and making them available um, is really important part of that step because I think especially during the pandemic, something I learned is that where you are is becoming like less not it's not irrelevant because it's definitely not irrelevant but I was so glad to be here this past year during the pandemic oh, totally. I had everything that I needed and more and with the like increase of um I guess supports that are going online I think that that makes things easier for business owners um, in rural places that don't necessarily get to attend um, those like professional development opportunities or networking opportunities in yeah. bigger cities so I think it kind of even the playing field a little bit um, in terms of like everybody's online now so it doesn't matter whether you're in Bonavista or in New York City to a certain degree other than there's less COVID here Totally. So. <laughs> totally. Um, I, I think that yeah. there, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's my answer to that. And um, I'm sorry for hijacking that question. No, but, I think that's um, totally great. Yeah. Yeah. Hand it over to you. If either of you have any thoughts about, about that. Claire? Um, I think that of the the whole idea of of being rural and uh, is a bit of a moot point. You know, it's it is our inspiration without question for me. It's it's everything that I that I sort of soak in and try to interpret and try to capture and all the rest. Um, but it's you know we're we're a much much uh, broader, bigger community of people and. I, I can't even count on fingers and toes how many times I, I was thankful to be in this place, to be able to work away, you know, like you, Claire and Jane. This is, for me, this is six or seven days a week right now. And I'm absolutely thrilled. We laughed about this the other day. It's like pinch me every single day because I fill my mug up and go downstairs and I get to work and I get to do things that I believe that that uh, contribute to a bigger community and a larger place and, a, and all the rest. And I'm eternally thankful to not have to navigate big cities and mm -hmm. all of the concerns that you know are, are very much part of what's going on in other parts of the country and the world. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful, so anyways. Claire, do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, living in Halifax, it's not quite as as small, I guess, as as being in Bonavista. But um, you know, I think making the decision to move to a, a more rural place, I, I think, sort of like both of you said, like there's kind of no no greater place to be. And and it's funny because I think back to the very first time I went to Bonavista, it was. Um, it was at Christmas 2016, uh, going into 2017, and 
like even then, um, you know, I was just visiting and like the sense of community was so apparent even then. Um, like it was not like in season, a lot of the businesses were closed, but you could still sort of feel it. And yeah. there was a snowstorm and the highway got stormed out and we got stranded in Bonavista for an extra day. But like, <laughs> it just like, it didn't matter. Like it just, it was its own little thing. And, yeah. and ever since then I've just had this sort of bug in my ear that like there's something really special going on in Bonavista. I think there's also a, another sort of extension of that is that there are I remember asking people because I got that sense as well when I mm -hmm. when I came here to meet John Norman I thought well there's something happening here and I've asked yeah. a couple of people one is I know is on the group that's watching us talk about these things and another one was a, just sort of a random s stranger and I sort of said what was it what is it about this place that the peninsula just feels connected and wanting to help each other and the community is strong and I said when did this happen and they said probably 15 or so years ago which then calls into what we know that we just received here which is the UNESCO designation it talks about sort of all of the new community initiatives Jane and Union House Arts and the wonderful things that happened there by having a community art show was the first I think one of my first art shows other than having the kelp sheep I you know never had one before you know and so there is this wider bigger um, again that groundswell of of people all along the peninsula all around Newfoundland that are are really interested in in supporting each other it's it is it's quite a remarkable place for that and, and as I was we were talking with Emily said is that I don't know that you would find this at this scale at both a rural and a global level anywhere else in in Canada that I've known of or internationally I don't know so it's a great place well uh Thank you so much for this conversation. I think that it has been a very eye-opening and inspiring conversation to understand a little bit more about like your creative business and your, your creative mind in a rural set, setup and, and how that, that is possible. Although there is a lot of people that like question that. Um, it, it, it is very inspiring to hear your stories and, and hear what's happening in Buena Vista. Uh, both with artists and with arts organizations such as the Union Arts House uh, that is a massive open space for artists over there. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that came tonight for this conversation and, and watch this uh, and share this moment with those grateful artists. Uh, and I'd like to remind everyone that next week is the last craft conversation of the winter series. Uh, it's with the hug, Rug Hooking Guild of Newfoundland and Labrador. So if you haven't signed up, uh, you have until next Wednesday to sign up. Uh, so do that. Um, thank you again, Barbara, Claire, and thank you so much, Jane, for conducting this conversation. Uh, and keep an eye out for all the programming that is coming out from Craft at the Edge and also for the Union Arts House uh, programming for this year. Uh, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. So much.